Hello, I'm Miriam and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager for the Ulster Orchestra. As you know, for the last couple of weeks we've been doing a lot of recording for BBC Radio 3. The pieces that we've been recording will be going out in October of this year, so if you keep an eye on our website and social media we'll be able to tell you more about those closer to the time. One of the works that we recorded last week was a piece by David Matthews, Variations on a Bach Chorale. Now if the name David Matthews is ringing a bell, it might be because we performed his 8th Symphony a couple of seasons ago, thanks to the PRS Foundation's Resonate Scheme. David Matthews is, quite simply, one of the UK's great modern composers. The conductor on that occasion a couple of seasons ago, as well as last week, was Jacques Van Steen. Jacques and David are great friends and we were thrilled to hear that David would be willing to have a bit of a chat with us for UO Let's Play at Home. Joining him is UO board member, Professor of Composition at Queen's, renowned composer in his own right, and general all-round good egg, Piers Hallowell. So I'm going to hand you over to Piers and David now. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I should just explain that if, uh, if anybody is sharing uh, with us in this conversation, I'm calling you uh, on behalf of the Ulster Orchestra to discuss yeah. uh, an upcoming work of yours uh, conducted by Jacques Van Steen uh, in the coming weeks and broadcast. Yes. And um, so obviously that was the first thing that I wanted, well not quite the first thing I wanted to ask you because I wanted just to ask you first how uh, this difficult period has been for you. I think composers have reacted in different ways. Um, has it been productive or frustrating or, or what for you in London? It's, it's been very productive actually. Uh, we've moved down to our house in Kent, away from London. We did that before the lockdown in fact, and have stayed there almost all the time. Uh, we've just only made one visit to London in fact, so we're going to go again at the end of this month. But it's been, it's, it's, it's a lovely place, it's Kingsdown, this is a little village near Deal in Kent and we're, we're on we're near, very near the sea so we go swimming and there are wonderful walks on the cliffs of White Cliffs of Dover and so on. Swimming. I'm very impressed. I'm also by the sea uh, but I'm in the north of Scotland and um, Scotland. I'm not intrepid enough um, but uh, it's as you say some people have, ourselves among them are very lucky to, to have been in beautiful places at this time yes. which many others have not. Um, well, I know. Has, yes. Has it been a time when you could think about art and think great thoughts, or? Uh, um, well, I have great thoughts, but certainly it's been very productive. I've written a great deal of music. I've I've worked more or less non-stop since I arrived. There was nothing else to do really. I, it's rather. I felt. It, I thought it's very strange because I no, there's nothing for me to do. I, all my performances are cancelled and so on, and I'm used to going to hear my own music and. And, and that of others, and and that but that's that, you know. And I, I'm here just just writing away. Absolutely. And uh, that, all right. And have I've been working taken, on an opera. Yes. Oh, right. Okay. So, have yes. you taken refuge as a listener uh, in the internet as a as a source of music? Yes, I, I've, been, I've been listening to a lot of things. Not not at first. I I, I really didn't didn't really listen much for the first month or so, but. Um, I have found things, uh, and, and, and particularly wonderful things on YouTube. Um, I've, I've got very, I got very interested in Carlos Kleiber and his recordings, and I found all of them just about. And I don't know whether you know these amazing films of him. Um, on, on no, YouTube. I mean I know the celebrated Beethoven Fifth recording, and I'm sure there's a film of that. Yes, there is, and and other Beethoven symphonies, and. Um, and then there's the recording of Tristan, which is extraordinary, which, which he walked out on before the day before it was due to finish, but Deutsche Grammophon agreed to, uh, uh, the Deutsche Grammophon decided they could issue it, they had enough material. And um, I was so angry, he, he gave up his contract with Deutsche Grammophon and never went into a recording studio again. This Goodness. is typical. Those are the days <laughs> when yeah, artistic temperament ruled. Yes. Well, yes, I must say, I also have, uh, have taken respite in similar territory. I somebody tipped me off that the Berlin Philharmonic uh, streaming was oh, uh, yes. free for the month of yes. April, and yes. even when it's not free, it's very good value. And yes. uh, I started watching, and in fact, this morning, just this morning, I was watching for the second or third time Marla Seven conducted by Haiti, 
absolutely yes. incredible. Um, oh. And the quality of sound, so wonderful. And the yes. very first thing actually that I did during the lockdown when I found this was to explore a work which everybody else uh, loves and I'd never got into, which was the Symphonia by Berio, um, which had a marvelous performance by Rattle just at the beginning of lockdown. Oh. And for oh. me, that was a revelation. Oh. Um, so there has been some sort of, uh, there has been a chance to delve into things that we oh. might not get round to otherwise. Yes. Um, let me ask you about the, the piece that, uh, that is coming up though, because as you say, it's so hard to, to get anything yes. uh, played at the moment. Um, yes, it's wonderful of Jack to do this. I, I, was, I was very surprised when he rang me up and said, look, I've got this concert. Well, he, he, uh, he said, can you suggest pieces? And I suggested the, um, the, the tippet to him. Yes, uh, do. In fact, didn't. I think that that is also in the program, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yes. And then he said, I'd like to do a piece of yours and could you suggest this? And I thought this piece was ideal really because not only is it just for strings, it's for 24 strings which are often used as soloists. So if they wanted to be socially distanced, that would be that would be very suitable. I don't know quite how they did it actually, because I because I of course I didn't go. No. Um, I decided that I wouldn't go. I think I, I mean I haven't been doing anything like that. I haven't been travelling. Uh, I haven't been on a train. Very wise. March, and I haven't I haven't been on a plane certainly. But there we are. So um, the work is, is variations on a chorale. It's variations on a Bach chorale. A Bach, a Bach, so it's on a particular existing piece. Yeah. Yes, yes, it, and, and um, it has a history. Shall I tell you a bit about it? Please, because please do, yes. It was, it was commissioned by the English Chamber Orchestra because I was then their music advisor and they commissioned a number of pieces in, um, in, in 19, early 1986. And I'd just been to what was then Czechoslovakia, to Brno, because uh, I'd been asked to, set, to, to do a seminar for the Jan Hus Foundation, which was operating as an underground university in Czech Republic, and um, in Czechoslovakia rather, as it was then. And um, in, it, it, it started with philosophy in Prague, but it spread to Brno. And the man who was running the seminars there was an extraordinary theatre director called Petr Ossesli. And he, was, he put on very daring productions, which somehow um, evaded, and he, didn't, he wasn't in any trouble with the secret police, or if he did, if he was a, if, talk to them, he could talk his way out of it. Um, and he, and he, he did extraordinary things. He, for example, he put on a performance of Arturo Uri, where the Hitler character was obviously meant to be the Czech president. <laughs> no one he still noticed. didn't get arrested. No one, he still didn't get arrested. Anyway, he asked, he asked me to, um, to get, he, he, uh, he asked for someone to come and do, to start a music uh, uh, seminar series. And he wanted to start with Mahler because he said Mahler had been neglected by the communists, and he thought it was partly due to anti-Semitism yeah. um, uh, in in in, che in Czechoslovakia. And despite the fact that Mahler was born there, and um, he wanted me to talk, uh, we wanted someone to talk about Mahler and particularly about Mahler's Tenth Symphony. And because I worked on Mahler's Tenth Symphony with Derek Cook and my. Um, I went out. I was. Uh, he, he. It was through Roger Scruton who I got to know, and uh, he was sort of running events there. And um, so I went out and I talked to. I gave this seminar, and uh, there was about I think twenty five or thirty people crammed into his flat. Uh, it was all strictly illegal, of course. But um, I think that, the, we'll call it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But I don't think they took much notice of these. Well, they did actually at one time. They 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 arrested Jacques Derrida, who'd come to um, give a, a philosophy seminar because there was a French branch of the Yankees Foundation, and they arrested him. And he was only freed by the intervention of Mitterrand. Mm -hmm. And um, but I think after that they didn't really bother with us very much. Um, they certainly didn't bother with me. I thought they, I think they probably realised that music is not very subversive. <laughs> but it was of great use to them the students who I was talking to, because they had very little contact with what was going on here or, or anywhere in Western Europe. Yes. And um, so we, we brought in scores and recordings for them. And uh, I arranged for a number of other composers to go out, including Judith Weir and Michael Barclay, Nigel Osborne. Um, and, and it was very successful, right? And it continued up to, the, up to 1989. Uh, and I made two very, very good friends. Um, who are still friends, Yaroslav Stjasny 
um, who was who was actually Peter's uh, Peter Ossus's pianist in his theatre company, and and, a, and, a, and, a, and an interesting composer, and Pavel Novak, uh, who we both who, know, yeah, we both know, yes, and who's now become was the, the probably the leading composer in Czech Republic, yeah, uh, and 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 I got I got William Howard involved as well, who uh, you know and this this led to a lot of things, indeed. Uh, so, so anyway, but the thing is, uh, the, the reason why I wrote this particular piece was that um, I, while there, I did meet, I, I took in messages for dissidents and so on, and um, it was a bit of spying. Uh, <laughs> David, I never suspected. No. Well, they, I guess they were in code in my diary, I remember. And um, I did meet some of the dissidents uh, there who spoke about the situation and how frightened they were of being arrested and and um because you know they knew the secret police were everywhere and, and they didn't know who they were there were people in every street who would inform on you and yeah. particularly they cottoned on to the children their children and asked them questions so they, their children were under strict orders not to not to say anything um and so i felt these people i met were in a certain amount of danger and so i i chose this bar chorale because it's a prayer for a peaceful night that people will remain safe during the night, and I dedicated to my friends in dedicated to my friends in Vilno. and um, so that's that's how it started. That's the background, but it wasn't performed in Brno at that time. No, it, no, it, it, it hasn't been performed in Brno. In fact, um, I think they had a recording. Well, they did have a recording, yes, because the, the UCO made a BBC recording. I'm still adjusting to the to the revelation of your kind of spy past. Um, <laughs> tremendous. <laughs> It well, reminded me of a story about the um, the uh, Orient Express, which, about which m many fantasies have been woven. I, yes. I once heard that the only verified story of uh, East-West espionage involved a composer who had encoded, or a spy posing as a composer, and this is supposedly true, who I think travelling from East to West was, was stopped, and he had in fact he had in fact encoded whatever the material was in a yeah. kind of um, musical notation uh, spelling device that we would be familiar with and the people sort of asked him what is this and he he affected huge outrage and said so how dare you this is my new serial composition and demanded a piano in the station where he was held and proceeded to sort of bash out this thing and give it credibility yeah. and they all blocked their ears duly Whereas in fact, I think he was, it was genuinely encoded kind of stuff. So there's a, there's a kind of message about modernism in there somewhere, but still. <laughs> so he never got involved in anything like that, I'm sure. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, so the piece dates back to 1986. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. And I wonder... And, there are, uh, and I mean, there are, there are um, what is it, like eight variations, I'm just looking at this. Eight variations, then the chorale, then an epilogue. Um, and and I, I wanted, I was thinking really of Strauss's Metamorphosen and thinking that I would write for uh, a texture which would occasionally involve all the players being so, soloists. Yeah. All the time, obviously, as, as in Strauss. But, and uh, so the theme yeah. comes at the end, just from Alyssa's point of view, they shouldn't expect the big Gives and Lazarus kind of statement at the beginning. I mean, I introduced the 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 main idea. Well, the main main idea of the of the of the main thematic idea of the chorale is just a rising scale. So I use that right at the beginning, and it and and, and that and its inversion go right through the piece, so that when the the the, the, the chorale appears, I think it's not a surprise. At least I yeah. think it's not a surprise. I mean, I was I I, I like this this idea. Britain did it, of course, didn't he? And he's, um, um, Absolutely, where you bring the lacrime or whatever it is out of the, the to take a bow at the end, as it were. Yes. Yeah. Um, thinking about that, I mean, it's one of our most traditional kind of uh, musical journeys, I suppose, the, the theme variations form. Do you see a kind of, do you feel a clear link to, for example, chorale variation composers back in you know, the 17th century, where that was a very standard way to treat what were very well-known materials. I mean, do you feel that you're still in that tradition? Because I, it's quite unusual now to find kind of theme and variations work. Yes. Yes, I know it, it is. I, I, I've always been fond of the, the, the variation form. And yes, I do. I do. 
I mean, I'm very conscious of tradition and wanting yeah. to relate to it. So I like using traditional forms. I mean, I use sonata forms still in uh, in pieces, in symphonies, for example. Yes, I want to, well, I want to come on to that in a bit, but um, still thinking about this work, do you delineate the variations in a kind of, I mean, you've only got strings, so you haven't got a, yeah. uh, you can't do what Britain does in the, young person's guide and kind of go around the orchestra yeah. in the same way. Do you, you must have to use other ways to maybe variations of tempo or register yes. something. Yes, yes, and uh, very different textures, very different kinds of texture. Um, there is, I mean, the, the, the opening, the opening one, the first one is, it, it is a kind of minimalist piece actually. Right. Um, and then, then, then there's the various dances. There's a Sicilian, which is the second one. Um, there are several scherzos, um, and then the the epilogue is the is, is, is starts as as it began with the with the first variation, and then goes off slightly differently to make a different ending. Um, but yes, I, I mean, they're contrasted. You can easily hear where each variation begins. So let's, let's say that, which I think is, uh, I mean, I like the idea of, of, of listening to variations and knowing where I am. And yeah. sometimes when I, when I hear people who say that they write variations now in, 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 in today, I, I don't hear them really as variations because I sort of lose track of the theme yep. or lose track of what, what's going on. That's exactly uh, what was behind my question. Um, yes. It always seems to me there are two traditions of variation. There's the kind of clear-cut tradition that yes. you might find in, say, the Diabelli variations, That's where you hear true. something stop and you hear the next one start. Yes. Yes. Then at the same time, um, mm -hmm. there is like the late quartets. I think it's the, is it the slow movement to the E-flat quartet? E -flat, yeah. where I remember Hugh McDonald once saying to me when he first heard this, he, he had no idea that it was a variation movement because it's so seamless. And yes. in the end, yes. uh, on greater acquaintance, you start to see the the interstices, but you don't at the time when you first hear yes. it. No, 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 you don't. No. Listeners don't get a lot of help. Uh, first time listeners have to work hard in late Beethoven and indeed in the music of many of our colleagues nowadays. Yes. Um, so you, you do believe in kind of structural signposts, as it were. But yes, I think so. Yes, yes, I do. Um, I think it's because I prefer you know, that kind of thing myself. So I thought, well, um, I've thought, well, I'll do it. I'll do the same kind of things because that's the that's the kind of music I enjoy most. Absolutely. This is quite a, a um, an old piece in terms of. I'm just trying to do the maths. I mean, we're talking about quite a few decades now. Okay, um, yes. I wanted to yes. ask you, yes, um, from your point of view, how that, how you feel about you know, when older pieces come out for an outing, um, is it, I mean, are there some that do and some that don't? Do you feel, for example, maybe even something they have that you don't have? I mean, I feel something about works of mine from that time that I don't have anymore, and I'm philosophical about that, but I think that's something that age can sometimes inflict on us. Yes, I, I mean, sometimes I think, oh, I, I actually wrote a lot better then than I do now. I, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I can see that um, that I have, I, I think, well, I've changed, certainly. It's it's slightly different, I, though it, 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 I still feel very much at home with uh, with the, the kind of language that I was using then, which is which is a bit more, um, I can't say, it's not really modern. I mean, whatever that word means. Um, yours. Some of, some of my some of my music at that time was more uh, more sort of modernist in a way than I do than I do now, and less clearly tonal. I mean, I'm very got got very keen on clear tonality now. So um, yeah, but I, I yes, I don't. I mean, it was very interesting to hear it again um, when Ken Woods re uh, recorded it. I didn't know really know he did, um, but he no. he recorded it on a CD uh, last year. Or was it the year before? Anyway, um, recently with my with together with my Ninth Symphony, um, and I, I I mean I suggested that piece to him because he wanted a string piece, and um, I, I I also because I hadn't heard it since I can't remember when it was it was it was given a couple of performances at the time by the ECO, but then the, then that that was that, and nobody else nobody else performed it, so it hadn't been performed for over thirty years. 
But do, does that affect your estimation of words? Because I suffer from a terrible kind of morale collapse if that happens to work. And I just think, well, they can't be any good. And then if somebody uh, prompts some kind of uh, examination and it gets played and I think it's all right, then suddenly the, the kind of um, clapometer sort of goes up for me. And I think oh, it's all right after all. Yeah, well, I, 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 I think I just accept the fact that nowadays you don't usually get your pieces played very much, you know, um, even if they get really good reviews. Like my, my, my Sixth Symphony got wonderful reviews. It was done at the proms. It's never been done since. Yeah. That was in 1994 or something like that. I mean, I, it was, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you just have to accept this. Yeah. And I suppose the, you know, the, the, the great thing is that, um, that I've got a lot of pieces recorded and at least I can hear them on CD and at least they'll last for me exactly. that way. I um, think that is the key nowadays when so much, particularly now at the moment, when so much of our music uh, is, you know, silenced by the, the global circumstance. Um, yes, I, I yes. had a new disc out right at the beginning of this period and, you know, and the virus didn't sort of stop didn't stop that in quite the same way as yeah. it stopped performances so i know exactly what you mean um yes. but uh, we we have a i think it's an interesting relationship that composers have with older music the way i sometimes try to explain it for me i don't know if it's true for you is that i think of the those sort of younger pieces as like uh, raw ingredients rather like a you know, a pizza that's not gone into the oven. So the ingredients are much more separable. And I can sometimes say, well, this was going on. And then under that, this was going on. And I can be quite sort of, I can separate them. And then by the process of time, they get cooked. And then you take them out of the oven and all those ingredients have kind of melded together. So you can't really separate them. But maybe you have something that is more kind of integrated than, you know, yes. that, uh, you lose something and you get something else maybe. Yes, 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 I think so, yes. Mm. I mean, my very early pieces are still, some of, some of them are still played. I mean, I remember that, um, well, because I'm having all my string quartets recorded by the Kreutzer Quartet, and I, I was a bit reluctant to have the first quartet played, because I thought, is it, is it actually any good, even though I did actually call it my first quartet after having written about four or five others, really? which, I, which, which I rejected. But, um, even though I don't think it's 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 especially good, no, no, nor my first symphony, I, I I don't mind it. I don't mind the fact that it's out there, and I don't suppose many people will be playing these pieces. It's part of the story, though, isn't it? I mean, you can't you can't have yes. a, a disc of quartets two, three, four, five, and six no, without no. number one. No. Everybody will wonder what, what you know what's what's up with number one. Um, no. I think it is a very interesting. Uh, relationship. I mean, I sometimes revisit pieces and I definitely f feel estranged from them, not in a bad way, but I think, you know, did I really write that? It seems extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, it does seem extraordinary. Yes, I, I, I do. Because you, you forget, mm. you forget how you felt when you were, write, were writing these pieces yeah. a long time ago and you and that the, there the pieces are and you think, oh yes, I, I'm sorry I wrote that. Yes, well, It's funny when you think that to write a piece, I mean, yeah. one, you know, we have to believe in every single tiny decision that we make. So it yes. must matter at the time. And, yes. and it, there's just something sort of removed. And I've spoken to other composers who said they sort of listen to something and think, so how did I do that? You know, yeah. there is a kind of uh, offshore feeling about them, which means it's fun to hear them, I, I guess, you know, because you lose yeah. a lot of the baggage, I suppose, that we have with more recent pieces. Yes. Oh, well, I think, that, I mean, I often look at my piece and think, how on earth did I do it? And, I, I, and when I've finished a piece, I think, will I ever be able to write anything again? And <laughs> I think that's the right thought. I think it's very important. Uh, I still have that feeling when I start a piece, I think I can't begin, you know, I can't do it. And then mm -hmm. I think, well, I should have done it before. So but I think that's yes. what we should yes. feel, because then we're not so, just rewriting yeah. the same piece. You know, oh, if no. you think, oh, I've done this before, I can do another one, then that would no. be a product. So... I quite agree, you know, one should have that. And you're always slightly disappointed with when the piece is finished, that it wasn't better than it is. And you think, oh, well, next time. Next, next will... time, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yes, yes, there's a point at which that feeling of about a project that's coming metamorphoses into, you know, the realities of what you're wrestling with. I don't know. Yes. Um, it's very interesting, but I wanted to move on 
um, just because we have you, to, uh, well, you mentioned yourself, the issue of the relationship with tonality. Um, I was thinking mm -hmm. that in a way now all of us as composers individually have some kind of relationship or no relationship at all with tonality in its widest sense. And mm -hmm. then I heard last week uh, Radio 3 broadcast um, Bernstein's performance of Mile of Five from the proms in the 1980s and I heard him talk and he said he said this and I, I wrote it down actually on a scrap of paper on the table here not knowing I was going to be talking to you um, he said the idea of the symphony is a tonal idea and you know he, he was contextualizing his own work and everything but I wonder what you thought of that I wonder whether you thought firstly that the the idea that a symphony needs to be that it is a set it has to be a tonal idea and secondly whether that's true for you because you're one of our relatively few um consistent you know lifelong symphonists and mm. uh, so that's a bit you know it's an interesting context nowadays i think i think i i do largely agree with that and i i think that um the the arguments in symphonies uh, have to have great contrasts of harmony, for example, and of, of uh, and of um, movement. And I think it's it's very much it's very hard to do these th things for me anyway, unless I use some kind of tonal base for for both. Um, I think it's the way I think. I I I. I I realize. I mean, I, I'm, I, I, I think tonally. Um, I mean, it's often very extended tonality, but uh, yeah. there's always, a, there's, all, there's, and there's, always, there's always a place is a return to stability after instability. I like the contrast between dissonance and and um, consonance, and between stability and instability, and you can do that on a very large scale on, on, on in the in the symphony. I mean, there are. I don't know. I mean, there are. I mean, I like Weber Symphony, for example, but um, yeah. I wouldn't say it was a. I wouldn't. I don't know whether it's really a symphony. <laughs> it's yeah. a nice. When, when I was thinking about pieces to ask you about that are not tonal symphonies, that yes. came up, and I immediately thought, well, we only yes. call it a symphony because he did. And, yes. Uh, I, I know. Yeah. Um. I don't know. Uh, I, I, I wonder I'm not, about a work like. Rigid. I'm not as rigid as Robert Simpson, for example, because I was brought up on Robert Simpson's ideas about symphonies, and he said, of course, that Stravinsky's symphonies are real symphonies because they don't have proper harmonic movement. Struggle, yeah. They, 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 they're, they're written in blocks, and he said that's not symphonic. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, don't, I don't agree with him, but I know what he means. Yes, well, I mean, that sounds, uh, that sounds as if he's applying Lenny's definition about the yes. idea of symphony is a tonal yes. idea. I mean, yes. I'm thinking of a work like um, uh, like my own teacher, uh, Nicholas Moore's Odyssey, which isn't called symphony, yes. but had that kind of scope and traditional yes. discourse. I mean, does something like that continue the tradition, do you think? I think it does, yes. I mean, he could have called that a symphony if he'd wanted to, I suppose, even though it's there aren't any... You know, it's not not like any other symphony that's ever been written, but still, yeah. Um, and it doesn't really have a proper program as such, so it's not. It's a symphonic poem in some ways, I suppose. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, you know, um, Ein Hildenleben is that a symphony? I mean, the, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, you know, I, there's lots of. I, I I don't know. It, it isn't actually because I, I think that um, you know the pro, if there is a strong programmatic element as there is in nine hundred and or, or or Sibelius made this very good um, distinction I think, and Tapiola is obviously not a symphony, it's a symphonic poem, mm. and um, and 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 it has you know a relation to a kind of program, and though, though there might be some kind of programmatic elements in the symphonies. Uh, they are different from the tone poems, definitely. They are different, yes. I mean, to me, Tapiola seems more it's more of like a variation set. It's well, it, is very, it is a set of variations, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Yes. Um, and just to go back to what you said, you sort of touched on your relationship to tonality, but I wonder if that, it, just to be a bit nerdy for a minute, with apologies to 
uh, to the, the viewer, listener. Are you thinking in terms of um, tonality, in terms of notes, of pitch centers, or are you talking about keys in the way that we all understand them, you know, in, in their relation to pieces by Brahms or whatever? Yes. Well, I mean, um, in in the first place, I was thinking definitely in terms, not in terms of of, of keys, but of pitch centers. Yeah. Or, or uh, and I was I was I was also influenced a lot by Nick Moore, mm, and uh, and uh, and um, uh, particularly by his piece Scenes and Arias. And he, uh, you know, totally. he, that was where I came in. Yeah, which of course is based on you know a, a, a chord to which you keep returning. And the chord functions in a way as a tonal center, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, and um, that hit me like a truck when I was about 21. And uh, yeah. I was yeah, telling yeah. William Bowden about this the other day, where I remembered uh, at my home here in Scotland, knowing that Nicholas Moore's Scenes and Arias was on the radio. And I was at the top yes. of a hill out the back. And I ran all the way down the hill across the rocks and everything to get back to be in time. And I thought, I would love to write a work that made somebody run across the hillside in order not to miss it, as yeah. I did for that. And then I went on to study a bit with Nick, you know. Yes. Well, he, I, was a, he was a sort of unofficial teacher, but he was a wonderful teacher. And he made yeah. me aware of so many things. He said, you must get your, you must work out your harmonies, your, your harmonic world and, and keep to it. You know, you've Absolutely. Got to your own rules, but then stick to them. Absolutely. Uh, and I find that the things and he said was, come back more and more. I mean, I, I started jotting down some thoughts about compositional development during the lockdown. And the things I kept that kept coming to mind were actually things he said that I'd forgotten about entirely, yeah. but which sort yeah. of surfaced as truths, you know, which was great. Yes. Um, I'm getting off the subject of your symphony. So I just want to say, we are now at number nine, is that? Yes, I'm actually, I am actually started number 10. You started number uh, 10. I haven't got very far with it, but I have actually started it, yes. Excellent. Well, you've got past the sort of ninth, um, the historical wrinkle of the ninth. Yes, yes, I, I guess. I made the ninth quite short and, um, and <laughs> not very, a bit like Shostakovich's, uh, not like Beethoven's, because I thought, well, I'd get it over with, and then yes. <laughs> it's not that I'm superficial, yep. but I just wanted to write a fairly, like not lightweight again, but um, a fairly a fairly small a smallish work, and then get on to number ten, which I thought would be bigger. Great. So this would be a much bigger piece, I think. So this uh, the attitude to the tonal drama thing has that changed? Can we sort of see a um, a development through that from the early ones? Yes, I, I think so. Yes, I mean they 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 gradually become more tonal. I think. I mean, numbers one and two aren't really very tonal. Number one, especially, I think. That's interesting. Um, um, but then, then, then they the number number five was an attempt to write much in a much more classical way. Um, and the last three have all been very strongly tonal in various in in, in their ways. Yes, and I think yeah. this this one will be too. Um, but the the so traditional I repertoire, and I'm thinking particularly here of um, you know Ulster Orchestra repertoire. Um, yeah. that, that we hear all the time. That is still very important to you, the Nielsen and Sibelius. The oh, absolutely. absolutely. Nielsen and Sibelius, yes, fantastic. I mean, you know, they renewed the symphony after yeah. it was thought, well, I mean, Boulez used to say, you know, the symphony ended with Marlowe, which, like a lot of what Boulez says, was, was, was incorrect. Turned out to be um, true, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, um, but it just it just didn't it just moved i mean there aren't many there aren't many great austrian or german symphonies after after Mara true schmidt um is very good uh kurt Weill's second symphony is very good i think and yeah. he should say if only he should be able to stay in germany he might have become a sort of major symphonist instead of a, uh, a broadway composer um much earlier you mentioned uh tippet with whom i think you're going to be sharing a program yes. Um, I know that you were, um, you know, involved with, uh, you know, the generation before you, obviously, as a student and, and working with Britain and people. I mean, was Tippett important to you or perhaps I should say? Oh, very you? important, yes. I suppose he was my favourite uh, British composer at the time when I was a teenager. Yeah, mine too. Um, yes, more than Britain. Yeah. Um, 
though of course I, I got to admire Britain much more later I mean at the time and even when I was working with Britain I, though I respected him tremendously as a musician I didn't particularly like the music he was writing at the time I do I like it much more now I mean I always like Peter Grimes and the Symphony de Requiem and those pieces yeah. but I, yeah. I, I, I think that Tippett went deeper than Britain in some ways I mean, I always love the Midsummer Marriage. I think it's the great, the greatest British opera. I quite agree. Uh, it appeared on the radio about a month ago or two, and uh, yeah. you know, I just couldn't believe it. I'm separated by viral lockdown or whatever from my recording of it, but uh, yeah, I, I totally agree about that. And the Corelli Fantasia. I mean, oh, it, yes, itself, which you know, is a. Uh, I mean, it, it seems to kind of breathe new life into the the medium of strings and divided strings. It, it does, yes. No, it's one of his great pieces. And do you think that the uh, the early music aspect, the the baroque, the neo baroque aspect, or the neo whatever it is, neo Tudor aspect of Tippett is? Mm. Uh, do you think that that is a major part of that of, of his makeup, or is that overplayed? I mean. Some of his pieces seem to, you know, quite firmly turn their back on the past, and others. Yes, I mean, it was it was as a starting point. I think he was influenced quite a lot by that music, which he knew he knew well, didn't he? He was one of the first. Uh, he, he and Britain uh, really um, got to grips with the music of the seventeenth century, in particular. Yeah. I mean, he, he gave the first performance of the um, in, in this country, didn't he? Of the uh, of the Monteverdi Vespers, I think. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and um, uh, yes, I, but I think that probably you know, Beethoven was more important, uh, and uh, and the way Beethoven wrote fugues. I mean, he was very interested in fugues, wasn't he? I mean, he only studied fugue, and the, the third quartet has three the fugues. Fourth, yes. Terrific sinewy writing, kind of gross the fuga revisit. He was always a wonderful contrapuntalist. So I suppose that came, I mean, that came from earlier music. Indeed, yeah, from from lines, yeah. And do you find renewal of counterpoint an important kind of area for you? Yes, I, 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 I just simply love writing counterpoint. I mean, it's just, just a, something I, I can do and something I really enjoy doing. And I've written fugues myself. Yeah, um, which I find just very interesting to do. I think it's partly because I didn't go to music college, so I wasn't forced to do these ah, things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, had... I was going to ask you whether it was bashed into you that you had to answer a, you know, tonic entry with a dominant entry or whatever. You know. Yes. yes. No, I, 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 I was more or less self-taught until I met various people who helped me, like Nick Moore and um, Anthony Bulner. I had private lessons with, and he was very yeah. good. And, the skull thought was also extremely useful. But, um, uh, you know, it was a gradual process of picking up things from, from other people. Yeah. But I didn't go through, I didn't go through the, the traditional way of, uh, of, of acquiring skills. It's interesting uh, that your output is characterized by, perhaps more so than maybe some others, by traditional forms like, you know, variation and symphony, yeah. that you didn't come through a traditional kind of uh, no. schooling, you say. But if I had been to, if I had been to the Royal College of the Royal Academy or something, I might have been stopped writing this thing. Because yeah. they it's far too uh, out of date. Because yeah. I've met people who have had that experience, who are told not to write in that, and they wanted to write tonal music, for example, they, they couldn't. Well, there's always an awful lot of fashion in teaching, as in everything else. In life, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, indeed. So we greatly look forward to your your work for strings. Um, could you just remind us finally of the the duration? Because I think it's always helpful for a listener to know how long a piece is. Well, it's interesting because I was actually going to guess eighteen minutes, right? And in fact, it, it's seventeen minutes forty nine seconds. So it is eighteen minutes. Right, it could be eighteen. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, and yes. Uh, you mentioned spatial seating at the beginning. It, does it actually use antiphonal writing, uh, for example? Uh, there, there is a bit of that, yes. Yeah. But I mean, the main thing is, I think, you know, the, the, because of everybody thinks of themselves as a soloist, they can be apart from the others. I, I mean, I'd be very in interested to know how I, it's going to sound different from, 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 from being recorded in that way. I don't think it does, because I've been listening to things 
like for example Simon Ruttle's prom I was listening to and I think that there was space, spatial difference there but could, you couldn't really sense it in the Vaughan Williams. I, did you hear that prom? No I haven't heard it yet I was out of the way and I'm it was a fantastic performance of, of, the, of both the Elgar and uh, Introduction Allegro and of uh, Vaughan Williams' Fifth Symphony. I've never heard Simon conduct Vaughan Williams and he, no. certain, he certainly understands. Yeah. I heard him talk that. about it on the radio beforehand. It was very, very moving. Yes. Idea, yes. Yes. I mean, all music is spatial, really. And of course, for the players it is. And I saw uh, on television some of the Ulster Orchestra players talking about the process of working in the waterfront hall and saying, you know, which I think the listener often doesn't realise, saying this is very difficult because, you know, I'm listening to the cellos for this or that bit and they're over there now and they're miles away and mm. all that is different. So, I mean, music is spatial, even if it's just flute and piano, isn't it? The sight lines and communication is always a factor. Yes. It doesn't just start being spatial because we unlock the balcony and put people in there. So. Mm -hmm. We very much look forward to hearing how it is. Um, I raised the antiphonal point because uh, this day on which we're, we happen to be talking, uh, I think the Ulster Orchestra are about to, to broadcast um, today as well, uh, playing double concerto pieces by, or you know, multi-orchestral group pieces by Martinu and Bartok. So uh, I think yes. it's been a bit of a feature in this time of spatial yes, yes. distancing. So, David, yeah. thank you very much for joining us. I'm most grateful yes. to hear uh, your, your thoughts on so many uh, you know, different topics at this time. And uh, we're grateful that technology allows it. And um, thank, you. Th thank you again for joining us. And I hope you'll be able to tune into your own piece when it comes. And yeah. lucky to tune into you. And thank you for joining us. And uh, keep well. And uh, very best thank with you. you your performance. Thanks very, for the Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Cheerio. Bye.